We are so glad to have everyone in worship. Didn't Miss Oakley do a great job reading? That was awesome. So there is a comedian named Emo Phillips that does a bit about Christians and their disagreements. And as the joke goes, there is a, a man who's walking across a bridge, and he notices another man who is about to jump. And so the passerby screams out and says, don't do it. And the distraught man says, but nobody loves me. And the passerby says, well, God loves you. Do you believe in God? Well, yes. Well, good. Me too. Are you a Christian or are you a Jew? I'm a Christian. Me too. Are, are you a Protestant or a Catholic? A Protestant. Me too. This is awesome. What denomination? Baptist. Well, I'm a Baptist too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist. That's awesome. Me too. Are you a conservative Baptist or a liberal Baptist? Conservative. Me too. That's awesome. Are you part of the, the Council of 1879 or 1912? 1912. And the passerby goes, die, you heretic, and pushes him off the bridge. <laughs> okay, we, we laugh, but the reality is sometimes it's exactly the world we feel like we're living in right now. It doesn't seem to matter how many ways we are the same. We have a culture that is constantly pointing out where we're different. Different. Today, we're continuing the sermon series called Finding Peace. And for the last couple of weeks, we've, we've really been setting the stage, talking about how Jesus is the source of peace. Whether you're talking about an inner peace, a, a peace of mind, or peace with those people around us, Jesus is the key. And yet, I think it's, it's only fair to also acknowledge <laughs> that the institution of church has been a piece of division in our culture for centuries. Today, I, I thought it was really important for us to talk about this relational piece as well. Now, with the election coming up this week, I, I don't think there is a more relevant time to talk about this message of how do we live peaceably with people we disagree with. No matter what happens on Tuesday, there are going to be some people who are hurt and angry. As Christians, I think we have this calling, this, this responsibility to be the calm in the crazy that is our world. Now, I certainly believe that as Christians, we are called to, to use our faith as we make decisions on the ballot. But that doesn't mean we will all agree. I believe that there are good, godly people who will vote on both sides of the election. And yet, as Christians, we sometimes struggle to realize we can disagree and still live in peace. I'm reminded of Methodism's founder, John Wesley, who, who always told, gave this advice to all of his pastors before an election. Vote for the person you deem most worthy. Speak no evil against the person you voted against. And do not quarrel with those who vote differently. It's great advice. And I also know sometimes it's not easy. Our culture seems to thrive on division right now. And it's not just that we disagree, it's that that person must somehow be our enemy. But today's scripture, it, it offers us a very different take. When we're talking about relational peace, uh, I think verse 18 is literally, truly one that we should try to live by. It says, if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, Paul's very straightforward here, and it's also very powerful. The reality is I, I have never met someone who verbally says they don't want peace. I have met some people whose actions sometimes make me question it, but nobody who says they don't want peace. 
And yet as a Christian, I, I have to confess that there are people who look at me and, and think maybe I don't want peace. Paul makes it clear. Peace may not always be possible. There will be people we disagree with. There will be people who rub us wrong. Always. And yet, there's this piece of us that can live peaceably with one another. Okay, let's do, let's do an informal poll right here. Raise your hand if there is anybody in your life that can be difficult to love, right? Anybody, raise your hand. Don't point, that's not nice. <laughs> we all have difficult people in our lives. And it, it seems our culture is kind of creating difficult people. Yet, I, I don't know if that's really as new as we think it is. Paul knew sometimes we were going to disagree. He knew that there would be times we wouldn't get along. He knew that there would always be difficult people in our lives. And still, we can live peaceably. I love the way author and pastor Craig Rochelle puts it. He says, being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. We're in a culture right now that, that's choosing to live offended by everything. That's why Paul's challenge is, is so important. He's not touting some magical, mythical formula where we're all just going to get along. We all view life through our own unique lens of experiences and emotions. We may disagree, but we can choose to live peaceably, even if others don't reciprocate. You know, as much as we'd like it, God has not given us the gift to control other people. We can't make their decisions for them. Even our kids, we can't make the decisions for them. But we can control our own decisions. We can choose how we are going to respond in those times of struggle. The challenge is how. When, when difficult people or difficult situations arise, how are we called as Christians to respond? And I think today's scripture gives us three very practical ways to do our best at living peaceably. The first is be a blessing. If you've got anyone who's difficult to love in your life right now, Paul says the best approach is to be a blessing to them. Notice he doesn't say, be a blessing to those you agree with. Be a blessing to those who go to your church. Be a blessing to those that are always the same as you are. Be a blessing to those who voted exactly the way you wanted them to. He says, be a blessing to those who disagree with. Paul looks to Jesus, the lessons that he taught and the example he lived, and in verse 14, he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. In the Greek, the word bless is eulogo. It's a combination of two different words, eu, which is good, and logo, which is word. And so a very literal translation of bless is to speak good over other people, to wish the best for them. That's a pretty good definition. But as Christians, it's not just speaking good for others, it is doing good for others. How we live this truth in the world. Now, let's be honest, it's, it's not always easy. It's challenging to be a blessing to those people we don't always like. 
It's easy to be nice to those that are nice to us. It, it, it's easy to be good to those who are good to us. It's fine to be a blessing to those who are a blessing to us. It is so much harder to be a blessing to someone who has hurt us or offended us. And if we're honest, there is a part of us that would love to, to just revert to the Old Testament view of an eye for an eye. If someone is mean to us, we want to be mean back. Or at the very least, we don't want to have to be nice to them anymore. We decide what goes around comes around. <laughs> you reap what you sow. In case you didn't realize it, karma is not a biblical belief, and yet sometimes that's exactly what we wish on people. Maybe you've never considered it that way, but, but I think we all do it. Hey, let's be honest. How many of you, when you're going down the interstate and somebody whips by you going 90 miles an hour and you see a few miles down the road they got pulled over and you start to do a little cheer dance in your car, right? Woohoo! You got what you deserved. But Paul says we are to bless those who persecute us. Paul says we are to bless those who hurt us. Paul says we are to live peaceably with those who don't see things the same way we do. Despite what they've done, despite how we feel, we are to be a blessing to others. And I know there's a part of us that thinks, but, but that's just not fair. We decide that's just setting yourself up to be hurt again in the future. Don't mishear me. I, I don't think this command is that we are somehow supposed to be a doormat for other people. It's a challenge that if we truly want peace, we have to show grace. We have to love people even when they are not lovable. Because that's what Christ did for us. I mean, the, the core of who we are, the core of what it means to be the church is this recognition that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And the solution, the key to peace in our world is not simply to accept that from God, but to emulate that for others as well. We have to to choose peace. As the body of Christ, we must do everything possible to live in peace with others. And that means we're called to be a blessing. But how? I think that brings us to number two. I think today's scripture is very obvious in saying we are to be there for others. Paul puts it in very practical terms, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We're not meant to just live in proximity to one another. We're meant to share life with one another. One of the things I, I love about the United Method denomination is that, that we are very practical in our faith, a very hands-on approach. Yes, we, we need to believe that Jesus is our Savior. Yes, we need to confess and repent of our sins. But much like the Apostle Paul, Methodism really pushes and preaches this idea that if we truly want to have our faith, it is going to be seen in the fruit we produce. It is our actions where our faith comes to life. You know, one of the core ministries of, of First Church is that mission to feed the hungry. Like the food drive we do. We're very intentional about our fall food drive being before Thanksgiving, one of the times that the pantry is often the most bare. We do our biggest food drive during the summer in connection with VBS. Again, a time that food pantries are often struggling. Every Wednesday, we... We serve a meal open to the community. 
Once a month, we serve at the Salvation Army and the Connection Homeless Shelter. But there are so many other ways that that we as the church live out our faith. With the weather getting cold, I'm reminded about our coat ministry. Every teacher in North Platte knows that they can refer a family to our church if they see a kid who doesn't have an adequate coat. And our church is committed to not just find a coat for that kid, but for anyone in their family who needs one. I I think about our helping hands fund that we use to help people who are stranded as travelers or, or people who fall behind on their bills. I think about our connection with McDonald Elementary School. I am so excited for this partnership. I am so excited that we have these bonus grandparents, as Micah calls them, that can breathe life into these kids. And yet I know it's just scratching the surface of what we can do. As a denomination, as a church, we can point to countless ministries where those are ways we live out our faith. And yet, bigger than any ministry, I I think, is truly just being there for one another. This was a a really busy week. It's always a busy week, right? But this one felt even busier for me. Uh, I had to go to Kansas City for meetings the first part of the week, and I went to Omaha with my mom for a doctor's appointment the second half of the week. And so I I was really not in the building hardly at all. (laughs) And then we actually... Uh, Kendra is on vacation, finishing up her two weeks. We're so happy she's coming back. Ugh. But we had a day that uh, Micah's uh, daycare wasn't available, so he was working from home, and Denise was working from home as well. And so, literally, we just had a volunteer in the office, and that was it. So thankful for those who, who do this for us. But one of those times when it was just the volunteer in the office... A lady comes in the door and she says, I need to talk to the pastor. The pastor's not here right now. Well, I need to talk to a staff member. Well, I'm sorry, none of them are available right now. Can I take a message or is there anything I can do? And the woman just breaks down crying and she says, I need somebody to pray with me right now. And her volunteer said, well, I can do that. And she got up and she came around the counter and they held hands They talked about what was going on. They cried and they prayed. And in that moment, the church was more alive than any single worship service. The call of peace is to be with one another, to share life with one another, to be the church in everything we do, not just with those we agree with, but even more so with those we struggle with. There are so many ways we can be the church, but Paul's challenge, the the heart of what he says, the, the real goal of finding peace comes when we choose to be there, to be there for others. And yet in order to do that, we have one more step that is really important. If we truly want to live peaceably with others, we must be humble. Now I know most of us consider ourselves to be pretty humble people. My son, Nate, always says it this way, I am the most humble person who has ever walked the face of the earth. (laughs) In case you missed it, sarcasm runs a little deep in our family. (laughs) But humility is one of those things that can be so easily misunderstood. I love the way Paul phrases it here. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Church, I don't know if you've recognized it, but we live in a culture that's pretty certain they're always right. We live in a culture where because you have read three stories on Facebook, you are now an expert. 
Sometimes the church does the same thing. So certain we're right, we forget to be with people. Humility is really the only antidote to the division we see in our world right now. There's a a quote that's credited to Pastor Rick Warren. I'm not sure if he's the first to ever say it, but in my research, he's the first I found who wrote it down. It says, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Humility isn't degrading ourselves and saying we're bad. Humility is being there for others. Humility is recognizing that whether we're right or not, we're supposed to be there for other people. Now, again, I don't want you to misunderstand that. We are not called to compromise our beliefs just for peace. Sometimes there are people in the world who are just plain wrong. And still we're called to love them. We are called to be a blessing for them. Now, Jesus didn't compromise his beliefs to please the crowds. He didn't compromise what was right just to get along. And still, Jesus spent the majority of his ministry with the least and the lost. Morally, theologically, Jesus was more aligned with the Pharisees than any other group at the time, and yet he chose socially to spend his time with sinners. That doesn't mean he condoned their sin. It means he loved them anyway. And the culture at the time, it it really misunderstood Jesus because of that. And I think our culture misunderstands us sometimes for the same reason. We are not meant to compromise our beliefs, but to love anyway doesn't change our mission. We are all sinners. We all fall short. And we can all love other people. In the 1900s, there was a a Sri Lankan pastor named D.T. Niles who said this, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Sometimes we think evangelism is telling the world where they're wrong. Sometimes we think evangelism is is pointing out the brokenness in other people's lives. And yet the bigger mission, the bigger point is to show them Christ. Sometimes our world is so busy telling people where they're wrong, we have forgotten to tell them about Jesus. Jesus. Church, our world, it is so divided right now. And I'm not here to try to convince you that that if we just follow Jesus, everything is going to magically be better. I don't think we're going to always get along with everyone. But our mission, our mission is still the same. To love, to serve, to be a blessing, to be with people, to be humble. See, even Paul realized it it doesn't always mean that other people are going to jump on board. It doesn't mean everyone is going to live peaceably with us. But the challenge that Paul gives us never changes. If it is possible... So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Amen? Amen. As we get ready for communion, I invite you to join me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, I I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the many ways that you show up in our lives and our world. 
And I thank you for the gift we have to not only receive your love, but share it with others. We ask you, God, to pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us that are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, that you would make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we can be Christ for the world, redeemed by your amazing love. By your Spirit, God, make us one with Jesus, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world, so that until Jesus comes in his final victory and until we all have a chance to feast at his heavenly banquet, we can always know what a great and amazing God you are. We ask all of this, God, through the name of your Son, Jesus, who, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, we give all honor and glory to you, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.